Welcome to Paramedicine.com, translating research into practice. I'm Mark Kolbeck at the ACU Sound Recording Studio in Queensland, Australia, and this is episode 4B, a supplementary episode adding a little bit to the respiratory exam. Specifically, we'll be looking at pulmonary embolism and vascular pathology. So in our previous episode, we talked a little bit about uh, assessing the patient who primarily has a respiratory complaint. And when we went over that assessment, um, Sonia and I didn't talk about the, the concept of a pulmonary embolism because we figured we would save that for when we're talking about the pulmonary embolism CPG, which is coming up. But then we talked about it a bit more and realized after the fact, no, we probably should include the assessment for pulmonary embolism in a respiratory assessment because quite often we get fooled by pulmonary embolisms and uh, our patient ends up having one when we weren't really suspecting it. So we're doing this supplemental show to add on that information and really just consider this a part of the normal respiratory exam. So we've spent an hour and 45 minutes almost talking about respiratory examination of a patient and now we're going to add on a few more minutes to bring it up to about a two-hour lecture, which is what you get in university. So pulmonary embolism. What is a pulmonary embolism? It's a blood clot that lands in the pulmonary vasculature. So if you think about, let's say you've got some veins down in your legs um, and you form a blood clot in those veins, they're going to travel from the venules down there into larger veins, eventually into the, the vena cava. And from the vena cava, they're going to come up to the right atrium. And all the time as they're going through those various vessels and chambers, the chambers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Right atrium goes to the right ventricle, goes to the pulmonary artery, and then the pulmonary arterioles, and then eventually into the pulmonary capillary bed, which is really small. And when that embolism gets caught in the pulmonary capillaries, it blocks, and everything distal, everything downstream from the block, isn't perfused. So you've got a bunch of air coming down into the alveoli and filling up the alveoli with fresh gas, but there isn't any blood passing through there to off-gas the carbon dioxide and intake the oxygen that's coming in. So essentially what you've got is what we would technically call a dead space pathology, not a shunt pathology. And that dead space pathology means that we're not properly exchanging the gases from our blood with the external atmosphere through ventilation, which is a problem because humans need to breathe in order to stay alive. And if you get a big enough pulmonary embolism, if I um, pinched off your pulmonary artery as it comes out of the right ventricle and didn't have any uh, ventilation occurring, you'd just die. So the larger the pulmonary embolism, the more pathology that we have. What causes these pulmonary embolisms? Well, we talk about something called Virchow's triad. Virchow is eponymous, obviously. It's a guy who helped discover this. But interestingly, Virchow himself didn't discover this. He kind of laid the groundwork for later discoveries that uh, are now called, retrospectively, Virchow's triad. So it's named after Virchow. And there are three elements that contribute to people getting um, blood clots that go into their lungs. The first is hypercoagulability of the blood. So if your blood is very thick, if it's very clotty, you're more likely to get a blood clot. That makes sense. Um, if you have some sort of hemodynamic changes, so if you've got stasis of the blood, if you've got excessive turbulence of the blood, then you're more likely to have the platelets activate and more likely to get um, clots and thrombi and emboli. And also if there's endothelial injury or dysfunction, so if your blood vessels are very irritated and activating the clotting cascade, then you're more likely to get clots as well. So those three things are what we think of when we think of Virchow's triad. So how does a pulmonary embolism present? Well, as a rough clinical rule, I'll go from the general to the, to the specific. As a rough general rule, if you've got somebody who seems relatively healthy with unexplained dyspnea, then you should be suspecting a pulmonary embolism. It's your sort of uh, diagnosis of last ditch. You know, it's like, I don't know why they're short of breath. Maybe it's a pulmonary embolism. So there was a study done called the uh, Pyoped study. And they took a look, it was, stood for uh, pers Prospective Investigation of Pulmonary Embolism Diagnosis. And I'll leave the show notes uh, a reference to this study. And they took a look at people with pulmonary embolism and asked retrospectively what um, uh, 
presentations were most common in these people. They found that 73% of them had dyspnea at rest or with exertion, so that was the most common. The next was pleuritic chest pain, about 66% had that. Now we start getting into less than half of the people. So about 44% of the people had calf or thigh pain or swelling. About 37% had cough, about 28% had orthopnea, 21% had wheezing. And the classic sign that we're taught for pulmonary embolism usually is uh, hemoptysis, coughing up blood. And that only happened 13% of the time. So what we should really be looking for is anybody with dyspnea on exertion uh, or pleuritic pain as the two most common presenting complaints, which is really just a huge clinical overlap with anybody who's having acute coronary syndrome. So if you have someone that you're thinking has acute coronary syndrome, you should also be thinking about uh, pulmonary embolism just in case as a diagnosis to rule out. So what are the criteria to help us diagnose a pulmonary embolism? Well, uh, clinicians have come up with a couple of tools and I'll mention three that you should be aware of. First, there's the WELLS criteria, W-E-L-L -L apostrophe S, the WELLS criteria. Then there's the pulmonary embolism rule out criteria, which we call the PERC score, P-E-R-C. And there's also something called the revised Geneva score. Now, all of those scores uh, have elements in them that we can't measure in the field, like D-dimers and, um, you know, scans and stuff that we don't do as paramedics. But they do talk a lot about actual uh, patient presentations that we should be aware of. So what I've done is I've gone through all of those scores and I've listed 15 of the things that we can actually check for. Now, memorizing a list of 15 items uh, is kind of difficult to do. If I gave you a shopping list with 15 items on it, you'd probably prefer that I write that down as opposed to expecting you to remember it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you a way to remember a, long, a large or long list that you can use in all of your studying. And it's a technique called memory theater. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to put down your pencil and paper if you're taking notes or, you know, just focus on imagining what I'm about to tell you, the story I'm about to tell you in your mind's eye as clearly as possible. This is how we do memory theater. I want you to, when I describe something, I want you to fill it in with as much detail as you can, as much color, as much weird stuff as you can think of. Imagine smells, imagine sights, imagine textures, imagine the sounds that you're going to hear. And as I go through this, fill in as much detail as you can. The more detail you give it, the more memorable it will be. So here's the story. We are walking onto an airplane. An airplane is the first thing I want you to remember. You're on an airplane. And as we walk into this airplane, I want you to imagine the smell of an airplane, the sounds of an airplane, what it feels like to be on an airplane, if you've ever been on one. And walking in, imagining the color of the seats and the flight crew there greeting you. And as you walk into this airplane, you're the first person. And in the middle of the airplane, you see a bed. Now, when I imagine this, I imagine this is a great big four-poster bed with, you know, ornate heavy cloths, like an old Victorian bed or something like that. So you walk onto an airplane and you see a bed. And in this bed, you see a woman. And the woman has a few characteristics. First, she's older. And I like to imagine her as like unimaginably old, a Methuselah type of, you know, ancient person lying on this bed. Because the, the more exaggerated you think of these things, the more likely you are to remember them. So this very, very old woman is lying on a bed in an airplane. And along with being very, very old, she's also morbidly, morbidly obese. She's a really, really large woman as well. And she's lying in the bed. She's old, she's obese, and she's very tall. In fact, she's so ridiculously tall that her head are on the pillows and her legs go all the way down and her legs come off the end of the bed and her knees bend and her feet are actually on the floor. So let's review for a second. You're in an airplane. In the airplane, there's a bed. And on the bed, there's a woman. And the woman has three specific characteristics. She's very old, she's very obese, and she's very, very tall. Okay? 
You got all that in your head? Good. So, let's keep on going. You also notice something else very strange about this woman. This woman has a mask, like a diving mask with a snorkel attached to it. I think of it as a bright orange one because that's what I had when I was a kid. And that's sitting on her forehead. And as you look down her face, you also notice that she has a mustache. And she's sticking out her tongue, and there's a pill on her tongue. So let's go back, because I really want you to solidify this in your memory. You're on an airplane, and in the airplane is a bed. And in the bed is a woman. And that woman has three particular characteristics. The first is that she is old. Fill in the blanks before I say them. The second is that she is obese. And the third is that she is very tall. And on her forehead, she has a diving mask. On her upper lip, she has a mustache. And on her tongue, she has a pill. Good. Make sure you've got that comfortably in your mind. Imagine it as richly and as deeply as you can. If you want to go backwards, you can. There's a woman with, on her tongue, a pill. On her upper lip, a mustache. On her forehead, a mask. She is lying in a bed. She has three characteristics. She is very tall, very obese, and very old. And the bed is on a airplane. Good. Let's keep on taking a look at this woman. As we take a look at her left hand, we notice that she's holding a lit cigarette. So she's obviously a smoker. We'll go from her left hand across her chest to her right hand. So left hand has a cigarette. On her chest, we notice that she's had a mastectomy and she only has one breast. We can imagine that she doesn't have any clothes or anything on so we can see her fully. So she has a mastectomy, one of her breasts are gone, and she's also, next thing, attached to an ECG machine. And in her right hand, she has uh, like a heroin needle, as an IV drug abuser would. Okay, So she's got, in her left hand, she's got a cigarette, on her chest, we notice two things. The first is mastectomy. The second is she's got a cardiac monitor on. And in her right hand, we notice that she has a IV needle, IV drug abuse needle. Okay, so let's go down now. We're going to take a look at her legs, both sides of the legs, and move across. So when we take a look at her left leg, we notice that she is in a cast, basically, from her hip down to the ends of her toes. Now remember, she's hanging off the bed. So that cast on her left leg is actually on a 90 degree angle. She's got that immobilized um, uh, leg. And between her legs, she has a baby because she just gave birth. This woman's having a heck of a day. She just gave birth. And her right leg is ischemic and swollen. So it's pale, it's cool, it's swollen, and it's sore. So let's go back to the beginning. We're on an airplane. We walk into the airplane and we see a, fill in the blanks as I do this, we see a bed. And on the bed is a woman with three very clear characteristics. She is very old, very obese, and very tall. And on her head, we notice three things. On her forehead is a mask. And on her upper lip is a mustache. And on her tongue is a pill. And then we take a look as we go from the left arm to the right arm and we see four things. The first is in her left hand is a cigarette. On her chest we notice two things. One is that she has had a mastectomy and the other is she's hooked up to a cardiac monitor. And in her right hand she has an IV needle for drug abuse. As we go down to her legs, we notice three things. One with the left leg, one with the right leg, and one in between. Her left leg is in a cast. Between her legs, there is a baby. And on her right leg, we notice that it is ischemic and swollen and sore. If you get that in your mind really well, then you'll have a really clear picture. Now, when I do this in a lecture, I say to the students, I just want you to imagine this for a second. And then when I'm done, I say, okay, now tell me the risk factors for pulmonary embolism. And there's silence in the class. 
And everybody looks at each other like, are we supposed to know that? Like, how do we know that? We've just memorized this thing. And then someone, the penny drops, and they go, oh, uh, women, yes. Elderly women, yes. Who, who've been flying, yes. Uh, who are, what, sleeping? Prolonged bed rest. Oh, okay, prolonged bed rest, sure, because of, you know, stasis. Uh, and then they keep on going. Um, who've been diving? Yeah, flying and diving can introduce the pressure differences, which can lead to pulmonary embolism. Oh, okay. Uh, who have a mustache? Uh, hormone replacement therapy. Oh, right, okay. And what about the pill on her tongue? Birth control pills. Women who take birth control pills are hypercoagulable. So it's one of the questions we ask anybody who's got shortness of breath. Now be prepared to defend that. I remember working clinically and asking a young woman who was profoundly short of breath if she's on the birth control pill. And she understandably said, why is that any of your business? And I said, because women who take the birth control pill are more likely to get clots in their lungs, which can lead to shortness of breath. And I just said it calmly and professionally, and she immediately stepped back and went, oh, okay, yeah, sure, that makes sense. Yes, I am. Okay, so that explains up to so far where we are in their head. Now we take a look at the left hand, which has, what's in the left hand? A cigarette. Smoking is, predisposes more to pulmonary embolism. A mastectomy. Why do people get mastectomies? Because they've got breast cancer, and cancer makes us hypercoagulable. So anybody with any sort of cancer is at a higher risk of pulmonary embolism. They're also on a monitor. Why would they be on a monitor? The reason they're on a monitor is we're looking for atrial fibrillation. And if our patient is in atrial fibrillation, what it means is that their atria aren't squeezing and contracting in an organized way, so they're not getting a really good, full, complete ejection of blood. And what tends to happen when we have venous stasis, when the blood isn't moving smoothly, is that it starts to clot. So um, anybody in AFib has the risk of creating clots, usually that adhere to the wall of the atria. And those are called mural clots. A mural in art is a painting that is painted directly onto the wall, not onto a canvas or something like that. So in the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo was painting murals because he was painting directly onto the walls themselves. Mural means wall. So mural clots are clots that are stuck to the wall of the atria. And when atria are in AFib, every so often they'll be able to produce a coordinated contraction. And when they do, they'll often eject the mural clots into the circulation. If they're ejected from the right atria, they go into the right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and they lodge in the lungs as a pulmonary embolism. So that's a risk factor for pulmonary embolism. It's also, interestingly, and beyond this respiratory assessment, a risk factor for other sorts of ischemia. So if we blow out a mural clot from our left atria, it goes into the left ventricle and then out into the body. Now, it could go from the aorta into the coronary circulation and then we get acute coronary syndrome or it could go up to the brain and we get a stroke or it could go to blood vessels that supply um, the abdomen and we get a mesenteric infarct or we could get an ischemic limb or we could get a renal infarct or any sort of systemic infarct from this clot which originally came from the walls of the left ventricle. So pulmonary embolism, we're thinking more about the right, but of course when someone's in AFib, they're in AFib on both sides, so they're at all sorts of risk for ischemia. Let's go back for a second. The cigarette was the smoking, that's a risk factor. The mastectomy was cancer. The monitor is AFib. Uh, why would IV drug abuse be a danger? Because it irritates the endothelium, and that gets us back to Virchow's triad, and irritated endothelium produces more clots. So IV drug users are a problem. Um, oh, I missed one. I talked about the fact that, I think I missed one. I talked about the fact that she's elderly. The elderly are more likely to get um, blood clots. I talked about the fact that she's obese and the obese are more likely to get blood clots because fat is very poorly perfused. So you get a lot of poor circulation going through the fat and there's more room in this poorly perfused fat blood vessels for clots to occur. And the fact that she's very tall. And specifically, we think about people with Marfan syndrome or you know um, genetic problems with connective tissue that make them very, very tall. So well, tall people are at more risk missed that bit. Let's go back. We've done the smoking, the mastectomy, the AFib. We've done the IV drug use. Uh, let's go down the body further, and we remember that her left leg, what's special about her left leg? 
What's special is that it's in a cast. So long bone fractures are more likely to give us uh, pulmonary embolisms. And postpartum women are more likely to have amniotic pulmonary embolisms. And people who have ischemic, swollen, sore limbs are more likely to have um, pulmonary embolisms as well. That's a sign of pulmonary embolism because they've got a venous clot in the actual leg itself. So now, if you can remember, when I'm talking with my students I, and we're doing scenarios and stuff and they say, oh, okay, um, yeah, I'm asking about shortness of breath. Um, what are some of the things I should ask about? And I, they struggle for a bit and I go, girl on an airplane. And they go, oh, right, right, okay. Uh, have you been flying recently? Have you been diving recently? I'm just looking, are they female? Yes. Are they elderly? Would we say over 50 years old or so? Yes, they are. Okay, let's keep on going. Flying and diving. Um, are you on hormone replacement therapy? Do you take birth control pills? Are they obese? I'm taking a look. Are they really tall? I'm taking a look. Do you smoke? Uh, do you have cancer? Have you had cancer? Let's hook them up on the monitor, see if they're an AFib. I can feel their pulse, feel if it's irregularly irregular. irregularly irregular. That would make me think that maybe they've got um, uh, AFib. Take a look. Maybe it's, you know, they're throwing PVCs or what. But irregularly irregular pulse, I think. Uh-oh, might be AFib. Let's take a look. Do you do IV drugs? Are you an IV drug abuser? Let's take a look for track marks on their blood vessels. Are they morbidly obese? Have you broken any bones lately? Have you been in a cast lately? Have you delivered a baby lately? Have you been pregnant or are you pregnant? Uh, have you had any sore arms or legs? Have you noticed that they're really sensitive or sore? So that's when you think back to our respiratory assessment, I was saying that I want you to think about from the outside to the inside, starting with environment. Have they been, you know, in excessively hot environments? Have they been in high altitude, anything like that? Then we went to head injury. Then we went to the airway and we went down through the lungs and we went into the blood. When you ask about the blood, think about pulmonary embolism and ask the questions about girl on an airplane. Okay, so girl on an airplane is now a part of the assessment that you do to anybody who's short of breath, especially if it's unexplained and you're searching for a cause. The other thing that we separated was the physical assessment that you'd be doing. So the A to you, so accessory muscle use, breath sounds, condition of the skin, dyspnea, extending, finger SpO2 or hemoglobin sat, gas, all the way down to we ended up with you. And U was the ugliness of smoking. So we took a look for all the signs that we would have, the smoking face and the forelock and all the sorts of stuff that we talked about smoking in the last show. Well, we're going to add on a V now. And V is for vascular pathology. So we're trying to think, is there anything wrong with their blood vessels that make me concerned that they might be, you know, tipping into Virchow's triad and getting clots inside their body one of which might have lodged in their lungs. So we ask about, um, are their calves tender? Have they been sore? Because that's the largest capillary bed furthest from our heart. So that tends to be where clots form first. The, they're least perfused, especially in people who don't walk around a lot, which is why anybody who's come off of an airplane and a long flight, we think about like DVTs that have gone to the lungs. So have your calves been tender? We press on the calves for a sign and if it hurts, especially unilaterally, when we gently squeeze the calf, then we worry about that. We ask them to dorsiflect their feet, which means to move their toes towards their head, lift their foot up towards their head. Um, and if their calves hurt, especially, again, unilaterally, when they dorsiflect their toes, then we start to worry about vascular pathology. We ask if their calves have been aching at rest. We look for dilated superficial, superficial veins, um, uh, like varicose veins, or not the tortured, engorged varicose veins, but just dilated superficial veins at all. Either, whether we have varicose veins or just dilated superficial veins, that makes us concerned because, of course, if there's a clot, the blood backs up. And when it backs up, then the vessels get dilated. So if we see that, we think maybe there's a clot there. We look for discoloration in either direction. It can either be brightly red or it can be quite pale. We look for dysthermia, so color differences. It can be really warm or it can be really cool. Uh, and of course, we look for track marks, and the track marks indicate that they're IV drug users, which will give us endothelial inflammation uh, or pathology, which again will lead us to thinking about Virchow's triad and pulmonary embolism. That's it. That's the content we want to get across. 
short and sharp, as they say down here in Australia. I want you to think about the potential risk factors for a pulmonary embolism, which are girl on an airplane. Practice that. As you drive in to school or work, whatever you're doing, take one day and just practice girl on an airplane. Do it tonight, do it tomorrow, do it in a week. Make sure you've got it, make sure you're comfortable with it, and eventually it'll become, you know, easy as anything. Students do it here in lab all the time. They're very good at it. You can be good at it too. So we're going to ask about those criteria and we're going to do a physical assessment looking particularly at the calves and trying to find out whether or not they're sore, taking a look at the um, blood vessels, whether they're dilated, taking a look for track marks and any sort of indications of vascular pathology, dysthermia, discoloration. That's it. Nice, quick, easy podcast. Thanks for listening. Be sure to come visit us at the paramedicine.com website. You can reach us if you have questions uh, at our email, which is contact at paramedicine.com. We're on Twitter. We're on iTunes. Please leave a review. That's how new people find us. Uh, you can search Facebook. You can search YouTube for paramedicine.com, and you'll find us there. That's it for this episode. See you for the next one. In the meantime, remember, keep on studying, keep on caring, and keep safe out there. Hypercoagulability, hypercoagulability of the blood. Try it again. Now, memorizing a list of 15 items. Uh, now, memorizing a list of 15 things takes a lot of time. So I'm going to introduce you to something called memory theater. Try this again.
and tall, thin males often get spontaneous um, um, pulmonary embolisms as well, as well as pulmonary pneumothorax. Uh, 